Well, welcome back to everyone. It is hard to imagine that it is 2022 already. And I don't know, this little thing that interrupted life for two years, now I have to go back and count. But what year was that? And so, happy 2022. And this year's season is going to be, election period is going to be more stupendous than anything under the sun. And they're only going to keep better from years and years as we go. But as we begin all programs here at the USS Silverside, if you are capable, please stand and we will say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our series sponsors this year are a wonderful foundation out of the Holland area that believes in community service, whether it be the state, local, or federal levels, the Birch Foundation. They are a couple that grew up in the area, met during World War II, and after the war, dedicated their lives to public service. Their children have set up a foundation to carry on their memories and to support activities in our own communities that support service to the community through education. We're very proud to have the Birch Foundation sponsor this lecture series. We also, our media sponsor for this is Blue Lake Public Radio. That's an incredible station. If you do not listen to it, I highly recommend it. They are a wonderful group of people that do so much for us in the community, and we're proud to call them our sponsors. Spring 2022. As I was saying, we used to start this in January and canceled more than we had. And so we start now the third week in February, and we're very excited that this year's series is stupendous and wonderful. And we are leading it off with the best of the best, and we are following up the end of it with the best of the best. <laughs> So, as you can see, what you were handed here is our poster for the series. It lists all of the um, lectures. My hope is that you will take these around the places that you go to, such as coffee shops, gyms, churches, any place that you happen to go and leave them there for other people. All of the lecture information is available on this. It is available on our Facebook page. It's available on our website. It's also available for anyone to give us a call and ask us. This year, we have some incredible stories that we're going to be telling. And since we're going to be talking about World War II in the Pacific, that vessel out there on the channel, both of them may have had something to do with World War II in the Pacific. And so we are going to talk about both of our vessels during the season. One of those will be We'll be telling the story of the USS Silversides. That'll be done by Teresa and our curator, Don Kitchen. We'll also be talking about the war in Alaska because we don't think about the Pacific being cold like that, but it can be. And the, the um, Coast Guard Cutter McLean that we have here also sank a Japanese submarine off the coast of Alaska. And not a lot of people know much happened in Alaska because she wasn't a state yet, but she definitely is part of it. So take a look at all the wonderful topics that we will have here. Um, James Campbell will be coming back to talk about the Ghost Mountain Boys. We'll be talking about another local story about a man who grew up in Grand Haven and spent the rest of his life on the U, um, in Grand Haven, but during World War II was on the USS Flyer, which was a submarine that was sank off the coast of the Philippines in Japanese occupied waters. Up until that point, no submarine that had been sunk in Japanese occupied water had ever seen their sailors return to the United States without them first being killed or um, ending up in POW camps. These men went through a horrific experience, and I think their story is more exciting than the PT-109 story. But speaking of that PT-109 story, we're going to talk about that too when we talk about the presidents who served in World War II in the Pacific. We're going to leave that gentleman out that um, just hung out in Europe and decided not to come over the Pacific. And then there was another president, because he had some bad eyesight, that he didn't get to um, leave the country. And then there was another one 
that fit. They count him, they don't count him, but um, but he was still in school, but he technically was in, you know. We'll talk about those a little bit more, but uh, that is another one. We're going to talk about the China Burma India Theater. We're going to talk about the Doolittle Raid and the Hornet. We're going to talk about um, all these wonderful things. And so thank you for coming. My challenge to you, though, is that. We have a great audience that comes here. We have a great audience online, but we'd always love to see more people here. Because all of you that know us know that we do this to serve our mission. Because our mission is simple. Our mission is to honor the veteran. And there's no better way to honor the veteran than by giving people knowledge about what it is that they have done. It's very difficult to honor something that you know nothing about. So it is our privilege to be able to do that. But the more people we can share that with, the better. Today is President's Day. Now, Tom has the answer to this question. Okay, I say that there's seven presidents that served in World War II. Most of the other people say there's eight. Can anyone name seven or eight? No, you have the paper in front of you. You can't answer now. Sorry. You cannot answer. <laughs> okay, think about it. Who is our We'll start going in reverse. Who was our last president that served in World War II? And he's the one I question. Hmm? Bush the first. No, he is not the oh yes, he is the last president. Yes, he is the last president to serve in World War II in the Pacific. The one before that is whom? Now he's the one I debate because he was still in school when World War II. He was in the academy. Ronald so, Reagan. No, no, Ronald Reagan did not leave the United States, so he technically did not serve in the Pacific. Uh, Jimmy Carter? Jimmy Carter was in the Naval Academy at that point. Mm -hmm. He's going to be our truly submariner president. There's another president that may have served a little bit out of the submarine service. Okay, so go on here in our list. We have Eisenhower. He didn't make it to the Pacific. He was busy someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> we have Kennedy. We may have all heard about his time in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. We have Johnson. That's a question. I hear they wrote a whole set of rules about him. What constitutes service in a war zone <laughs> in order to be declared as part of that? We have Mr. Dixon. He served. We have our own Gerald Ford, who served. Served through a typhoon in the Navy. We have Jimmy Carter, who was in school. So some places considered him a World War II president, some places did not. We can debate that for a long period of time. We have Mr. Reagan, whose poor eyesight had him assigned to alternative duty in the United States. And we have George Bush the first. And George Bush the first is the one that was a quasi submariner because <laughs> after his plane went down off the island of Chi 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 Someone else dropped him a life raft. And the life raft, he crawled onto it, but the wave action kept moving him closer and closer to the Japanese occupied island of Chichi people. And um, just as he was thinking that his time was over with, because there had been rumors that the Japanese on that island were cannibalistic. And he was quite concerned about that, <laughs> as that would be. Just when he was thinking it was all lost, up pops a nice submarine and says, Come on, boy, get on board. And he served on a submarine for 30 days before he brought that. And I'm going to wait to tell you what his job is until the day we have that discussion about all of the presidents that served. Next week is the USS Flyer. I will be doing that presentation on the USS Flyer. And I'm very excited to be able to tell that story because there are so many twists and turns and so many interesting things and so much collaboration with people that have never met each other and oftentimes did not know each other existed until there came a problem. It's an incredible story and it's about Al uh, Alvin Jacobson is one of the survivors. He is from Grand Haven and it's going to be an extraordinary evening on that one as well. But you got to put up with me to take a lecture. Mm -hmm. Tonight we have our gentleman friend here. Uh, we're so thrilled to have you. You do such a wonderful job, and you keep it for your own witness. So thank you very much. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Ron to start our spring 
I love those pictures of the president. I especially love the fact that George Bush first. Notice how young he looked. Anybody know how old he was when he got shot down? Nineteen. He he left uh, Harvard to serve in the war and then went back and finished his career. Nineteen. Come on, we're the millennials in here. I want to, I want to talk to you about what to do at nineteen. This moment, my slides come up. It's kind of like when I taught high school. Uh, all the kids would always go to the back of the class. Yeah. <laughs> but I roam, so I'll, I'll get you. My voice should carry. I suspect uh, Ken, let me know if you can't hear me. What? Yeah. There we go. I love coming back here to talk at the submarine. I truly, truly do. Uh, and history is a passion for me, so I enjoy talking about that as well. Tonight is a particularly interesting program, uh, and it kicks off the program, as Peggy mentioned. In the books uh, on the, online, it's listed as my topic will be the road to World War II in the Pacific, but I call it the true event that brought the United States into World War II, both in the Pacific and in Europe, and that being, of course, Pearl Harbor. I have a sentimental attachment to Pearl Harbor, not that I was there exactly, uh, but a little like uh, George Bush being pulled onto the submarine. My parents were at Pearl Harbor during the attack, uh, some 13 years before I was came along, but well, anyway, yeah, they were, they were there on their first assignment after getting married. Uh, Mom had a found a bomb stuck in the kitchen table after the attack that had not gone off. But that's a whole other story. So Pearl Harbor. And I am Colonel Ron Janowski. Uh, I've been here many times before. I see many familiar faces. So if anybody uh, doesn't know me, I'm a graduate of West Point in 1976. I was in the Army for 22 years. Uh, I got out to come teach high school ROTC, first in Grand Rapids and then in Muskegon. I did that for 19 years. And along the way, I met uh, uh, Peggy's husband, George, and he recruited me to come teach at Muskegon Community College because I had just finished getting a master's degree in military history at night. And so I love history. I love teaching. Here we are. Can we get rid of that enter your search term? I will attempt that. Give me one moment here. If not, we'll work it into the presentation somehow. <laughs> Let's see if we can move this anywhere. I may have to stop your slide, do that. Okay. I enjoyed, I always start my presentations, almost always, and forgive me if I've done it to excess with previous presentations for you. History is like a river, events, of today are predicated on what happened before, whether it was yesterday, last week, last month, last year, whenever. And for that reason, to truly understand any historical event, you need to see what happened before. I got rid of this. But now you have to catch up. Okay. Good. So, history is like a river. And we can only truly analyze an event like Pearl Harbor by understanding what happened before to bring us to that point. Now, in the same way, when we look back on history, we inevitably distort it by our own prejudices, by our own understanding of the world as it is today. This is why it is such a, an amazing, you know, Terrible thing when people start declaring that people in the 1860s were racist or whatever. It is a very, very slippery slope. When we look back on history, it's inevitably distorted. History, after all, is a matter of opinion, isn't it? I mean, who here was around when Lincoln shot? No. Or how about uh, we might have a 
you know, maybe some people were here when uh, Teddy Roosevelt was president. <laughs> the fact is, we read that stuff, we find out about that stuff by reading history, by seeing history, whether it's on History Channel or in books, and those were written by human beings. And as human beings, we inevitably impart a flavor to what we see. You've all heard the old saying that if two people look at the same event, you're going to get two different stories. 100 people, 100 stories. So history is largely a matter of opinion. So we take as many viewpoints as we can to come up and hopefully capture the history, the reality of it somewhere in the middle. Okay, let's talk about the Japanese. They attacked in the early morning hours. They caught the enemy fleet completely unawares, devastated it. Within a space of two hours, the enemy fleet was almost totally disabled, and the Japanese were able to get away with nearly you know, un unharmed. And what was the date? Nineteen oh five. Four. There you go. For all of you this that just again. yes, for all yes. of you that don't well, know. In fact, the Battle of Port Arthur. It was the opening salvo in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. The Japanese and the Russians were contending for dominance in the Asian theater, and the Japanese struck the Russian fleet at Port Arthur and devastated it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And so it would become a template for Pearl Harbor. We'll get to that. Port Arthur, as you can see, is way out here. Uh, it's now a Japanese city of Luzhan or Lusan or something like that. The, Japan, the Russians are not there. But in 1904, it was, in fact, a Russian port, and they were attempting to gain dominance in that there. You can see Japan right here, so it was natural that there would be some conflict. Uh, I show this picture because it's difficult to imagine just how big the Pacific is. I mean, really big. For example, Take this and move it over here. <laughs> there. Look at that. The continental United States would fit between the Philippines and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And that's just half of the Pacific. It is an enormous space. But in 1904, it was of great interest in the world. This guy had something to do with it. This man is Alfred Thayer Mahan. Alfred Thayer Mahan was born at West Point, of all things, because his father was an instructor. But in his career, he became a Navy man. Having a son, I can understand why a son might do that. <laughs> Alfred Thayer Mahan was an instructor at the United States Naval Academy in 1890 when he wrote his greatest work, Sea power on history. In it, he proposed that the power of a nation is not based upon its size or its population, but in fact, it is based upon the control of colonies by which it can gather wealth and distribute wealth. And to control those colonies, one must control the sea. Albert Thayer Mahan based his knowledge upon his own extensive knowledge of naval warfare, dating all the way from the Greeks and Romans through medieval times, through Elizabeth, Elizabethan times, and all the way up to the Civil War in which he had actually served as a naval officer. By 1890 and by 1900, the world was a patchwork of colonies where countries were collecting these colonies in support and proving Thayer's, um, Thayer Mahan uh, thesis. Countries like Great Britain, as small as they are, and the Netherlands, even smaller, had gained great wealth through the use of sea power. And countries by 1900 were, were divvying up the world like a giant risk game, establishing colonies everywhere. 
Now, the United States was not yet part of that, but soon would be. In February of 1898, the Maine blew up in Havana Harbor, and it quickly became the cause for the Spanish-American War. Spain was in its waning days as a world power. The United States was on the rise. And in a matter of a year and a half, the United States had won the battle and won the Spanish-American War, and in the process, gained colonies, and for the first time, became an imperial power of sorts, having gained Cuba and other assets around the world. Alfred Thayer Mahan's theories were well thought of, but particularly by a young man who was a fighter in the Spanish-American War, who would later become, soon become, highly prominent in American politics. His name was Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt was a voracious reader, and he had read Mahan's work, and he believed in it. And he decided as president, he was going to do something about making the United States as powerful a sea power as he could. He commissioned what was called the Great White Fleet, a fleet of modern battleships that would represent the United States power in the world. Now, the Pacific was a region in which the United States obviously had interests, but the Spanish-American War had given them uh, the ability to navigate the Pacific far better than they could have beforehand. We not only had ga gathered up Cuba, but we'd also gathered the Philippines and Guam. And the year before that, unrelated to the Spanish-American War, we had gathered Hawaii. Conveniently, in the years before nuclear power, where ships had to be recoaled, these provided a convenient set of ports by which the United States could navigate and traverse the Pacific Ocean with ease. The Great White Fleet sailed around the world to show and demonstrate American resolve in sea power. But by 1900, many of the lands that were available a convenient word for the powerful taking over the weak, but nevertheless available had been already claimed. The last great plum on the tree was here. China. China was large, populated, but weak, and it was ready to be subjugated by Western powers. The United States, like many others, wanted to have access, and now that they had a foothold in but now that they had a foothold here, they wanted access to China. But the distance was so great. What they opted for was a surrogate. Japan. Japan had in the space of only 50 years, made huge leaps in progress. In 1853, they had been visited by Admiral Perry of the United States Navy. They were essentially a feudal organization. They were a feudal culture, the samurai, the shoguns, and into their harbor sails the black ships of Admiral Perry. They had been approached previously in the 1830s by American delegations, but nothing had really swayed the Japanese to open their ports until these black ships came in with artillery and guns and, and wholly impressive. The Japanese were cowed into opening Japan for the first time to the West. They couldn't make much sense of the round eyes who looked like devils, but they sure did appreciate those guns. <laughs> And they dedicated themselves, the Japanese did, over the next 50 years to becoming a power such as the West was. And they underwent an incredible transformation from 1853 to 1900, modernizing, even assuming dress similar to the West. Here you have some Japanese in traditional 
and others already assuming Western wear. By 1900, they were considering themselves equals to the West, certainly in their culture, their, their uh, weaponry. They were prepared to become a, a country of the first level in the West. Was the, rest, was the West ready to accept that? Not quite. The British and the Americans saw the Japanese as convenient puppets, surrogates, that would hold the Russians at bay in China. What a surprise that in 1904, when the Japanese flexed their muscles to show how far they had come, and they defeated the Russians on land and on sea. By 1905, the Russians had lost every single land battle and most of their fleet to the Japanese. It was a shocking revelation that the Japanese had come of age in only 50 years' time. That is Teddy Roosevelt in the middle. Roosevelt in the middle. He actually promised and came, made true the peace treaty, the Treaty of Portsmouth, which ended the Russo-Japanese War. And that's Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He actually brought the parties to New Hampshire and he arbitrated the conclusions of the war. The Russians were speechless. The Japanese were expecting to be treated as the victors in a war might. They expected to gain land, Sakhalin Island, which is just north of, of uh, Japan proper, and they expected war indemnity. That is, the Russians would pay for the repairs. We saw much of the same thing when the Germans lost World War I. The Japanese say, we want fair and square. We deserve the reparations. We deserve the indemnity. We, we deserve the land. Teddy Roosevelt, however, said, look, the Russians are so poor and so devastated and so weak that they're not going to give up the land. And in fact, the Russians refused at first to give up any land. And they absolutely refused to pay anything. In defeat, they were arrogant enough to say, we're not going to do any of that stuff that losers normally have to do. It was a contentious discussion over the period of several months until the Russians finally said, okay, the Japanese may have the lower half of Sakhalin Island, but we're not going to pay any indemnities. And the Japanese finally gave in. Roosevelt wrote them a strongly worded letter saying, look, you Japanese, you owe the world this peace. The Russians wouldn't be able to pay you anyway. So just take your half of the island and a pat on the back and be on your way. The Japanese were very disappointed in the final write-up of the treaty, but they accepted it. Meanwhile, the Western nations got diverted by other things. World War I broke out in 1914, went four years until 1918. And in that time, the Japanese left on their own, stewed. From 1904 to 1931. First of all, they rankled over the conditions they were forced to accept. They won, doggone it. But no indemnity and only half of the island they wanted. They also wanted some respect. We are not just trained pets. We are a nation on the rise and we demand that respect. They weren't getting it. As an island nation, they also wanted permission to build a mighty Navy, much as Britain had done in, in Europe. In the Naval Conference of 1921, they were allowed a portion of the ships that the Brits and the Americans were allowed to build. The ratio was something like five, five, and three. Uh, but it was still a level below. And they were unfortunately hampered by the fact that they were very poor in natural resources. As they were expanding, as any industrial nation expands, you need resources. You need iron, you need steel, you need uh, coal, you need oil. All these things Japan does not have. 
They had a big population, a small island, and a big desire to grow. So they needed their own colonies. They looked across the Sea of Japan to Japan. Since 19, 1895, they had dominated in Korea. They needed more though. And so they looked further into China and they started looking at expanding their influence and their control of China. Korea, Manchuria, it's a start. And in 1931, they move across the sea and they invade Manchuria. Their progress against the helpless Chinese was swift and brutal. Their invasion of the city of Nanking is usually referred to as the rape of Nanking. And by the way, that's that's not a human body up here. Every time I saw this picture, I said, oh my God. No, that's just that's an advertisement. But their brutality with the Chinese was at least as bad as Hanging's. Rape was truly committed, and the rape of Nanking stands even today as the height of brutality in a nation overcoming a lesser foe. The Japanese had a grand scheme. They wanted to establish an area in the Pacific Basin where they would control the economies. They would benefit. Now, everyone would benefit eventually. And in fact, they called it the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, but it would be Japanese run. And their idea was to control this area with Japan at the center, complete hegemony and massive economic power. The United States, however, recognized the voracious appetite of the Japanese as they grew. Now, it is true, the United States was wrapped up in World War I, but they were providing resources to Japan in the way of iron and oil. The United States starting, started to put the clamps on them just to see if they could cut them back. Not dissimilar to what we're hearing right now with the, uh, with the Russians uh, in Ukraine and trying to put economic clamps on them. But the Japanese were certainly more susceptible to this because of their weak position in natural resources. So by clamping down their oil and steel, their oil and iron, it would certainly get their attention. But in 1929, the United States had something else come up to pay its attention, the Great Depression. As we struggled with 25% unemployment, huge inflation, massive economic collapse. President Franklin Roosevelt focused on domestic affairs, not on the Pacific. And not in Europe either, although there were dark clouds forming in Europe. In 1922, Mussolini became the dictator of Italy. In 1933, Hitler came to power in Germany. They too were children of the Depression. They too were living and breathing off of the destruction that the Depression was bringing on their countries. And it was because of that environment that they were able to gin up support and power for their, their grand schemes. Eventually, they would dominate all of Europe. And although this dated 1943, the writing was on the wall. And you notice one of the few countries left was Great Britain, not yet under the heel of fascism. Britain had a traditional friendship with the United States. Not back to the revolution exactly, but certainly more recently in World War I. And in fact, the leader at this time, Winston Churchill was actually the son of an American mother. So he had connections, he wanted to 
bring the United States in, recognizing the great power that the United States represented. And he worked on building relationship with Franklin Roosevelt. As the British met disaster at Dunkirk, losing all of their equipment and salvaging what people they could on a makeshift flotilla of pleasure craft and anything else that would float, Winston Churchill became ever more insistent on working a deal with President Roosevelt and the United States. Roosevelt felt that Germany was in the wrong. He wanted to eventually help Britain, certainly soon, more sooner than later. But how to do it legally without declaring himself on the side against Germany had to be a legal tap dance. The United States, coming out of the Great Depression, this would create a great tool to help the United States recover its economy whether it's with building tanks and sending them anywhere in the world would take a legal trip. And what he came up with was a case where he said, we're not going to give you these as allies, but we will lend them to you. We will lease them to you. You can pay us back later. But this is purely a business deal, not a political statement. <laughs> and the Lend-Lease Act of 1941 established a flow of equipment to the British and later to the Russians uh, and other allies that would aid and help win World War II, thanks to the growth of the American industry. Roosevelt himself declared that the United States would become the great arsenal of <coughs> And so it soon became. As American industry came out of its slumber of the Depression and began developing weapons for the air, the land, the sea, in number that stagger the imagination. Meanwhile, Japan, still under that clamp, looks across the sea and sees the United States growing in power, economic power daily. They're not yet in the war, but they will certainly be a substantial opponent if they do enter. General Tojo, the premier of Japan, declares, if we don't do something now, we will be ground under. Now is the time. If we wait, the United States will simply drive right over us. In order to fulfill the dream of the co-prosperity sphere, it would help to have allies for Japan. And they looked around the world, certainly they weren't going to ally with the United States, but they looked at other like countries that were doing something similar. And in 1940, they signed the Tripartite Act, aligning themselves with the, Jap with the Germans and with the Italians. With this act, the members of the Tripartite believed that when the time came in the Pacific, the Japanese would render the Americans helpless. They would stagger the Americans and keep them from helping in the European theater. But a plan was needed. And for this, the Japanese turned to one of their most brilliant strategic thinkers. This is Admiral Yamamoto. Interestingly enough, I just read this week that his first name, Izuruku, means 56. His dad was 56 when he was born. Where did his name come from? There's a Ruku. But anyway, General Yamamoto, brilliant. He had spent time in the United States. In fact, he went to and graduated from Harvard. He spoke English, loved to play bridge, and he knew the American mind. He felt Americans were a little shiftless, perhaps, but once aroused, they would be a terrible enemy. He expressed these concerns, but he moved ahead as he was ordered to do and come up with a plan to defeat the Americans. Now, 
The United States in 1940, in the spring, no, summer of 1940, had moved their fleet from the west coast of the United States to Hawaii. They did it in order to cow the Japanese. Look at our ships. They are right here. They're halfway across the ocean looking right at you, Japan. Yamamoto took that into account. He looked at that and he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Three steps. First of all, we're going to strike that force in Hawaii. Not sure how we're going to do it yet, but that's what we're going to do first. We're going to blast them out of the water in Hawaii. Second step, we're going to set up a perimeter that we control all around the area that will be our co-prosperity sphere. Third step, establish the sphere, all economies under Japan and reporting to us. Destroy the American fleet, control the area, set up the co-prosperity sphere. Now, that first step, first step's always the hardest, isn't it? First, now the first part of any long journey is that first step and it's the most critical. So how do we hit Hawaii? How do we hit? Pearl Harbor. Well, the Americans have made it easy. <laughs> the harbor itself is fairly small. And look at this, they've lined up all their boats, like bowling alley. There they are. Now we just need to get at them. And what he comes up with is an audacious plan in which the Japanese will recommit a Fort Arthur attack. We will attack early in the morning. We will hit them when they're not expecting it. We'll do it on a Sunday. And they will never see us coming. That's going to be the hard part, but we can do this. And what they end up doing is putting together a fleet of four aircraft carriers with 353 attack aircraft. And they go a distance of 4,000 miles, which today takes you about seven hours to fly. This is a huge undertaking. And they come from the north on rarely used travel uh, paths in the ocean, routes. And when they're at their position, they give the go ahead and the planes take off. So they did. They came in two separate squadrons. The first hit Pearl Harbor at 7.55 on the morning of 7 December, 8 December, Tokyo time. One hour later at 8.50, the second wave came in. They also had submarines, miniature submarines in the area, which actually some histories have them being more effective than was originally thought. But nevertheless, the two waves of aircraft came in completely surprised the Americans. We had radar at the time, a very, very primitive radar, which picked up the flight coming in. But it was waved off as, well, we were expecting a flight of B-17s coming in from California today. That's probably just that. The attack came in on Ford Island and Pearl Harbor. This is an actual photograph of the Japanese plane attacking. You can see the geysers coming up on Battleship Row. Were they effective? Oh my goodness. Americans never saw it coming. Now, there is some controversy that Roosevelt knew it was going to happen and let it happen in order to allow us to get forced into World War II. Not true. There were two different codes that were in effect at the time. There was the Japanese naval code and there was the Japanese military code. We had broken the Japanese diplomatic code. And so we knew that they were planning on doing something, but we did not yet break the Japanese naval code. We didn't know where it was attacked, and we certainly didn't think they had the ability to reach all the way out 4,000 miles to Pearl Harbor. We were expecting Wake Island, something like that. But the devastation was massive. Over 3,000 killed of major capital ships, eight battleships, three cruisers, three destroyers damaged or sunk. And the Japanese lost almost nothing.
The Japanese had not intended, had not intended for it to be a surprise attack. They were aware of the diplomatic niceties. And these two men, who were the ambassadors in Washington, D.C., were instructed to report to Franklin Roosevelt no later than one in the afternoon and declare war, which would have been 55 minutes before the first flight arrived. However, they had trouble. They had trouble breaking their own code and putting it into a script by which they could take to Roosevelt. And as a result, they didn't show up until after the attack had occurred. So despite their intention of it being a formal first act of war declared, turned out to be the sneak attack, which we all know it by today. Not surprisingly, the Army and Navy in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii cleaned house of their two top men. Uh, Admiral Kimmel and General Short were both relieved of their commands, respectively. This man, Chester Nimitz, was put in command of the naval fleets of the Pacific. And he came and surveyed his new command and two weeks after the battle, after the attack, he made an interesting comment to the press. He said, well, Admiral Nimitz, what do you think? What do I think? I think God was looking out for us. <laughs> Admiral, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Three things did not happen that could happen. First of all, the Japanese hit our ships while they were in harbor and or in dry dock. As a result, ships did not block the channel into the harbor and they didn't sink at sea where we wouldn't be able to retrieve them. They sank in, rel sank, sank in relatively shallow water and they didn't destroy the dry docks. So we could easily get those ships floating into the dry dock, fix them up. Second. This is before nuclear power. What do ships run on? Coal, oil. Guess where most of the oil for the Pacific Fleet was? <clears throat> at Pearl Harbor, or at least very close. The Japanese probably flew over these oil fields on their way to the attack, and they didn't attack them. As a result, our entire fueling for the Pacific Fleet was untouched. Once the ships were fixed, we were ready to go. Third thing, there was a class of ships that was not on that list of destroyed. They were not in harbor that day. The three American aircraft carriers were at sea conducting maneuver on a Sunday morning, and they were spared the attack. As the Japanese had so brilliantly demonstrated the aircraft carrier was about to become the ship of choice in naval warfare. The time of the battleship was long gone. And now aircraft carriers would determine the future now and in the future. Our three carriers were not hit. Yamamoto was satisfied, but not happy. He wanted those carriers. He needed to destroy those carriers to truly cripple the American naval power in the Pacific. The carriers had to have been destroyed and they were not. Six months from now in a battle called Midway, he would rule that those carriers were still afloat. Yamamoto had questioned striking the American fleet. And he had said, I will be able to do this. I have six months. For six months, I can run crazy. If they're crippled, even better. But they aren't crippled. So I can't promise anything after six months. He said, knowing the Americans, a little bit lazy, but once brought to anger, I fear we've bitten off a whole lot more than 
we can choose. The following day, Franklin Roosevelt went for a joint session of Congress and to the, to the representatives and to the Senate, he asked for formal declaration of war against Japan. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. He got a near unanimous vote. One congressperson, I meant to look it up, I can't recall who it was, simply did not want any vote of Congress to be unanimous and so <laughs> voted against it. But it was a near unanimous vote and war now existed between the United States and the Empire of Japan. Okay, we're at war in the Pacific. But how about in the Atlantic? Well, as it turned out, somebody helped us with that. Hitler! Because of the tripartite pact, he was duty bound to defend his allies, Italy and Japan. And as soon as the United States declared war on Japan, on the 11th of December, just a few days after the attack at Pearl Harbor, Hitler stood up in the Reichstag and declared war on the United States. And we're on our way. By understanding what came before, we can understand better and appreciate better any given event. We cannot forecast the future. All we can get is trends. But certainly in looking back from Pearl Harbor, from the time of empire, through the growth of America as an imperial power, through the empowerment of Japan, and the West distracted. Ultimately, the stream led us to the day of infamy. The came before leads to this. Question. Was Yamamoto not aware that the carriers were not in port? No, he had spies. He did Ron, have spies. Can you repeat the question so that those at oh, home yeah. can hear it? Was Yamamoto not aware that the carriers were not in port? He did have spies throughout the Hawaiian Islands, but there was a delay in getting that information back. He knew within a few days that the battleships were there. He was not aware on the day of the 7th that the aircraft carriers were not. Do you think he would have changed the course of the attack had they been there? Oh, I'm sure he would have loved to. Now, the logistics of such a, a move going 4,000 miles under complete secrecy of silence and movement across and launching the whole thing, he may have. He may have been able to delay it a day or two, and yes, it would, he would have changed it. Absolutely. He needed to get those carriers. He had not started, he had started out as a battleship man, but in the 1920s and 30s, he had become an adherent and a proponent of the aircraft carrier, and he truly believed in the aircraft carrier as the weapon that would win the war. He wanted those carriers back. Yes, he would have changed them. But on such small things, does history change, right? I used to tell kids in high school, never assume any decision you make in your life is small. Because you never know. You never know. So yeah, he would have changed that and where would have led? Ultimate universe. Question over here. Sir. Yeah. Do you really think there was much influence as Japan preparing all the now earlier or later? I mean, could the military have done anything like that short period of time? Could they even move it up out of that? Well, they might have been able to get aircraft in the air. They did have a, uh, a telegraph service. Uh, Western Union actually was able to send telegrams. 
uh, and they might have gotten some word if they had an hour or two advance notice, and they might have been able to get the, some level of preparation, aircraft in the air, any aircraft. Uh, they probably couldn't have moved the fleet because it takes a long time to build up a team. Could have done something. Not much. Most of the years are all over. Yeah. Yeah. And quite frankly, the Japanese aircraft at that time, the Zero, was probably the finest aircraft in the world at that time. We had P 40 Warhawks, which with a flying tiger design on it, it's really cool looking, but it wasn't up to the level of zero. I mean, slow. It could dive like crazy, but so can rocks. One little thing the Navy could have done was change their state of conditioning there for uh, water tech doors, portholes, uh, all that kind of stuff there because they were wide open for ventilation. Yeah. And uh, parts of more main hole covers are off. For inspection and maintenance and stuff like that, we could have sealed that up and possibly uh, not had so much water come in. They still would have been bombed out and everything and burned, but they would not have flooded as badly. Good job, Coastie. Yeah. I don't know what kind of inspection level they were out on a Sunday. I know when I was at the academy, Saturdays where they pull everything open in inspection. Uh, Sunday's for Friday, Monday, Monday. Monday, Monday, Saturday, it's Friday, Saturday, Saturday, it's a few days of session. Okay. Sir. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. What was that mean? You did not think that you crossed the torpedo thrust in shallow water. True, true, true. Ron, well, could you just yeah. repeat the question? Yeah, there was a, he said, we were totally naive thinking we could not get torpedoed in the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. And that is true. The Japanese, Stamped torpedoes and fitted them with special packages on the tail so that they would not dive so deep. Otherwise, a normal torpedo dropped from a torpedo bomber would have buried its nose into the bottom of the shallow curler. But they had worked out a device that would cause it to come up and they were able to fire torpedoes. Uh, there was an interesting story about the Japanese submarines, which I alluded to. Uh, they had some small miniature submarines, midget submarines. Uh, one was sunk uh, the very morning of the attack. Uh, others were found, I think one was found about 20 years ago, buried in the muck outside the, the harbor. There is a famous photo, uh, I don't know if I have available, but that shows a torpedo wake going towards a battleship, and there's no aircraft in the picture. And some photojournalist theorized that that might have been a miniature submarine that had gotten into Pearl Harbor proper. Uh, there's no way to prove or disprove it. But not all the submarines that set out from Japan returned. So who knows? But yeah, we didn't expect them to be able to torpedo in, in, in Pearl. We did. We figured it out. And it was a great advantage. Yeah. Didn't they dredge up one in Pearl Harbor? One of the mini subs? You know, that may have been part of the story why they think that one actually did get in. If, if they dredged it up, it did. See, man, one got dredged up and made part of a pier or something. The rain fill. If you ever get to New Hay, uh, to Groton, Connecticut, uh, the, the submarine base, they've got one of them on display outside of the building. Uh -huh. One down in Texas somewhere also. Yeah. And the USS Ling had um, one in their museum as well. Um, may I just add one little thing about Pearl Harbor? Sure. Now, you know, I know the aircraft carrier were very important and they weren't in base at that time, but there was something was in base that did not get destroyed at Pearl Harbor, and that was called the submarine force. Okay. And um, the submarines, which you'll hear about a little bit further down in the series, um, submarines were America's first line of defense after Pearl Harbor because that was one of the few vessels that were easily able to operate. And they were the first ones out after Pearl Harbor. And um, we are a submarine museum, so I have to give my, my breed, you know, all the justice they are due. And you will learn later on in the season here about all the wonderful things that submarines will do and how during the war in the Pacific, while America was rebuilding at Pearl Harbor, Submarines were the ones that first started to take out the supply lines 
and started to get, gather information because they were, um, they were undetectable at most points. And um, the amazing story. So you'll just have to hang on to hear more about those submarines at Pearl Harbor. The Germans might disagree with undetectable. Well, I would agree with that, yes. But the, mm -hmm. the Pacific was a little bit bigger. Yeah. And so we could uh, go a little bit more undetectable in the Pacific for a while. Yes, sir. I think that loan vote against the war declaration of the Congresswoman in Jeanette Rankin. Okay. I thought it was a female member, but I wasn't sure. And I, I didn't want to castigate someone on, without <laughs> research. Yeah. But yeah, uh, she had. She was for the war, but didn't want it to be a unanimous vote. Didn't want to set the precedent, as I understand it. Anything else? I'm more curious, uh, two Japanese um, people that were supposed to tell them that they declared war. Yeah. What happened to those guys? You know, they went back to Japan, and I think they're careers were pertained. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened to them. Um, but certainly they had brought dishonor on the Japanese nation by failing to get the word out. Couldn't have been good. <laughs> Couldn't have been good. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you mentioned reparations. Uh, yes. And I'm just wondering, over the period of the different wars, how many countries have actually paid the reparations that they were supposed to pay to whoever, or has that led to more conflicts? Well, it obviously did in World War One. <laughs> the Japanese, or I should say the Germans, were hit with this enormous reparation, which devastated their economy. There was a no way could they ever pay it, uh, and it destroyed them. Uh, inflation went to millions of marks for a loaf of bread. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how effective reparations are. Uh, I know that many of the victors in World War I uh, wanted to humble Germany. They really wanted to bring it back to a rural state, destroyed entirely. Uh, in the case of Japan, they simply wanted their new, new desserts. They won the war, and they wanted to get the reparations from the Russians they, they defeated. But they were told, Russians don't have the money. Mm -hmm. now, you can sue them if you want, but there's no money. Do any of our guests on Zoom um, have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask anyone if you have a question. Oh, well, thank you. I love these disembodied voices. I know you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> they love to show themselves. There's actually 24 people. Is that right? Yeah. Right. So uh, we're, you're only seeing a small group of that. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask away. Oh, Frank was out there. Yes. Okay. And Cliff, I recognize you. You've been on these many, many times. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I have. Enjoyed them all and enjoyed this one. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions, turn back over to Peggy. Let's say thank you to Ron for a wonderful. <laughs> for the short biographies of all the presidents that served in uh, World War II. They're right here. Fred Johnson will be speaking on that. So Stump the Professor is always the best name out there. So he's here for anyone that would like them. And um, thank you all for coming tonight. We would appreciate seeing all of you next week and any of your friends with you that we'd like to come with. Um, as you've noticed on the papers that I've given out, all of our lectures, as it stands, with the exception of two, are live with a person. There are two. Our gentleman that is going to be speaking about war in Alaska is in Fairbanks, Alaska. He will not be joining us in person. He will be zooming into the room with us. And our CBs were in the far away as well, and they will be zooming in. And those are the only two. As long as we're allowed to continue doing all this, all of our presentations will be in person with the exception of those two and they are marked there and you can come here speak with them or watch from zoom at home if you like yes uh, that presentation about 
Yes, we are working on rescheduling that for the first Monday in May. So there's 10 of these series, 10 in this series. So it would be the 11th. So we're working on getting that scheduled for that date. And um, keep your fingers crossed and that we will get that, that date, yes. Um, as I said, that's why we no longer start these in January because January is just so unpredictable. And even tonight, I was worried about it because all the storm warnings that were coming yesterday and today, um, we were getting a little concerned. But if ever there is a problem where the weather is so bad that you can't come here, just call us, get the Zoom link or email us and get the Zoom link and we're more than happy because wherever our speaker is, our speaker can Zoom too. And so it's one of the wonders of Zoom and I'm happy for the Zoom world to go away, but uh, I much prefer the in-person, but it is what it is and we will take it whatever way we want to get it. So I look forward to seeing everyone here next week for our own local story of submarines in the Pacific during World War II in the USS Flyer. Um, if any of you um, haven't seen it next week before the exhibits, uh, before the lecture starts, we'll read the exhibit that we have on it um, up and running so everybody can take a look at that and see some of the very cool artifacts that we have in there because some of the things that we have in that exhibit are just amazing. We actually have a copy of the notes that the Coast Watchers took and their reports. We do not have the original, so it's on the National Archives, but we do have copies of them. We also have the original peso, which you will learn all about, what happened with that peso. And we have some very unique things that came from some of the survivors and some of those who were lost and they, their families. And it's an amazing story. And so we look forward to seeing you all here. And does anyone have any questions before we finish up for the evening? Well, thank you all. For coming and keep up the good weather. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure.